That's what we're talking about uh, this morning and tonight. Please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as we continue this evening what we began this morning. As I mentioned, if you weren't here this morning, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is reminding the church about the actual physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mentioned also in context that uh, Greek Christians within that congregation were hanging on to various teachings uh, of their old pagan life and old pagan philosophies which doubted the actual possibility of physical resurrection. In their old life, in their old world, in their old philosophies, the, the, the very idea of physical resurrection was just something they couldn't, they couldn't accept. And so they were bringing in some of these doubts into the church. And some of these ideas began to spread in the church. And Paul is responding in 1 Corinthians, among other things, responding to these doubts. And he tells them several things in uh, the beginning of the chapter, chapter 15, beginning in verse 1 all the way to 28. I'll summarize these for you because we've already talked about them. First of all, he says, without Jesus' resurrection, their faith and their hope for forgiveness, their hope for resurrection and eternal life was foolish. Because if Jesus wasn't raised, well, they had no hope that they would be raised. If Jesus is raised, you're raised. But if you can't believe that Jesus was raised, then you have no hope for your own resurrection. That's what he tells the doubters. Secondly, he reviews with them the details of Jesus' resurrection and the confirmation of this fact by witnesses that were still alive at that time and could corroborate uh, his um, uh, his uh, teaching concerning the resurrection of Christ. He, he tells them once again, just in case you're not sure, just in case you're not sure of the history, just in case you're not sure of what the gospel is all about, it's all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and there are living witnesses of that resurrection that are still alive in our day, again, in the first century. So he talks about that and then thirdly, he goes on to describe the order and the process of the resurrection of the saints. He's talked about Jesus' resurrection, then he talks about the order and process of the individual's resurrections, the followers of Jesus. Basically he says Jesus is raised first, and then believers will be resurrected when Jesus returns. And he says their resurrection, the believer's resurrection, will also be accompanied by various events. First of all, the destruction of the wicked. In other words, the judgment will come. Secondly, the abolishment of death. No more death. And thirdly, the unification of God and man together. The Godhead and man will once again become one. There will be no sin between them, no barriers between the two. So after having explained to believers what to expect, he goes back to address the doubters once again. And so the next section is written as if Paul were addressing two groups simultaneously, speaking to one group and then the other. So as I say, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15 and we're going to pick it up in verse 29. Remember the way that this, this uh, chapter is laid out, as if he's talking to two groups of people. The doubters over here, the believers over here, and he goes back and forth. All right? So now he's going to speak once again to the doubters, beginning in verse 29. And he says to the doubters, if there is no resurrection, answer the following questions. So he challenges them. And he says in chapter 15, verse 29, otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? And so he says, why are people preparing for resurrection by being baptized? I mean, if there's no resurrection, why are people doing this, he says. Now this verse has caused a lot of consternation, a very different type of uh, analysis in the past, and you could kind of look at it in different ways, the way that it's laid out. First of all, you could say, well, maybe he means people are being baptized in order to get benefits for someone who's already dead. It could mean that. As a matter of fact, our Mormon friends use this scripture to 
support their idea and their practice of baptizing people for the dead. In other words, uh, they, you are baptized in order to receive the benefits of baptism for someone, perhaps one of your relatives, your father, your mother, your grandfather, who has already passed away. Well, if that's what it means, hmm, we've got some problems here. Because first of all, this idea, this idea of being baptized so that somebody else can get the benefit, this idea is not in context and it's not supported by any other biblical doctrine. So this would be the only verse that says this type of thing. Secondly, we know that you cannot be baptized in order to have someone else be forgiven and receive the Holy Spirit. Nowhere in the Bible, anywhere, is this idea even suggested. Thirdly, a doctrinal idea, you have to understand that a doctrinal idea suggested by one passage in the Bible needs to be supported by other passages in the Bible. There are passages in the Bible that claim that Jesus is the Son of God, but many other passages support that one passage. But nothing in the Bible supports the idea that a person could be baptized in order to gain benefits for someone who is already dead. That doesn't appear anyone else. And finally, Paul could also be referring to a mistaken idea that people had at the time. Maybe some people had that idea and it was a mistake and he was simply referring to it. Now that's one way you could look at it. You could read this verse and say, well maybe he means they were being baptized in order to gain benefits for people who had died. Maybe. We don't think so. Perhaps he means people are responding to the gospel in baptism on the strength of the teaching and example and encouragement of those Christians who have already died. I saw my mother, a godly woman, who was baptized and now she's passed away and I'm following her example. Maybe that's what it means. Well, if that's what it means, then it is well supported and repeated throughout the Bible. The point, whatever position a person takes, that Paul is making is, why are people preparing for death by being baptized if there is no such thing as resurrection? That's the point. This passage is not necessarily about baptism. It's about resurrection. Why would anybody receive baptism if there's no such thing as resurrection? Well, I wouldn't have got baptized. You know, 30 plus years ago, I wouldn't have accepted on a cold November night, no Heater in the baptistry in Montreal? Are you kidding me? At 10 o'clock at night, you know how cold that water? If there was no resurrection, why would I ever consider being baptized at all? And that's the point that he's making here. In verse 30 and 32, he continues this, uh, this discussion. He says, why are we also in danger every hour? I protest, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. He, he, he's talking again to the doubters and the ones that doubt the resurrection, and basically he's saying, if there is no resurrection, why am I, Paul, in danger? Why do I struggle? Why am I attacked for my preaching? Why would I even do that? Why don't I just enjoy this life if there is no life to come in the resurrection? I might as well, you know, eat, drink, be merry because this is all that I've got. Why struggle? Why fight? Why risk my life for a thing that's not true? And then in verse 33 and 34 he continues by saying, do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I speak this, he says, to your shame. This passage is oft quoted, bad company corrupts good morals. Paul rebukes all those who are being carried away by the doubters. They should be ashamed of themselves, he says, as Christians, for even considering such a thing. Now the bad company he's talking about here, he refers to uh, people here who are doubters who use their doubt 
as an excuse for sin. Those are the ones he's talking about here. You know, people unsure of the resurrection have a very hard time of letting go of this world. I have found not only in the passage here, but I found in my experience in ministry and as a Christian that doubters rarely sacrifice for Christ. Why should they? And doubters rarely take on the responsibility for leadership. Why should they? And doubters rarely go all out. They go in, but they're not all the way in. And usually the problem is there's doubt. And so he tells them that association with those who doubt and have lower morals because of that doubt will only weaken the ones who believe, not strengthen them. It is a sin to doubt God's promises, especially after such a great witness given by Jesus and the apostles. I mean, how much more evidence do we need is what he's saying to them. And I think we could say that today as well. Just how much evidence do we need to maintain our faith and our belief? Well, after he's talked to the doubters, he now gives details concerning the resurrection itself in verses 35 all the way to the end. So we've dealt with the doubters. We've described the procedure, you know, who comes first, who's resurrected when. We've challenged the doubters once again with a couple of questions. And now Paul describes the resurrection itself, referring once again to the believers. And he says, first of all, or he explains, first of all, the nature of the resurrection itself. And so we read verse 35, and he says, But someone will say, How are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a body of his own. Let's kind of stop there for a second. The doubters have raised the issue of how a dead, rotten body comes back to life. That's their argument. Are you kidding me? They're in the grave. My, my grandfather's been in the grave for 20 years or something. You know, there's no flesh left on his bones, or maybe he died in a fire or something like that. How can that body come back to life? And Paul explains by using the comparison of a seed. He says, the seed does not resemble the plant that grows from it. The seed, he says, must first be planted and then it needs to decay in the ground and from this, he says, a plant will eventually grow. One comes naturally from the other, but both, he says, are totally different from each other. And so this analogy, of course, is that a human body is planted in death in the earth and it resurrects a different body altogether. Verse 39 to 44 continues with this idea. He says, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men and another flesh of beasts and another flesh of birds and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly one and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body, it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Again, Paul explains how God has created different qualities of life in the entire creation. And these are evident, he says. For example, stars are different from plants. A tree is not like, like the sun. These are two different types of things. And plants are different than animals. You know, a, 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 an apple tree is different than a, a cow. These things are different types of life that God has created. 
And he uses this example to demonstrate that just like that there, are, there is a difference in various elements in the creation, there is also a difference between the human natural body and the glorious resurrected body. And the difference between them is one is natural and one is spiritual. And he says that God has created both. Now, the earthly body, he says, he describes it, is perishable, means it decays. And it is also dishonorable, it dies. And he says it is also weak, in the sense that it is weak physically and it is weak morally. Then he goes on to describe the spiritual body and he says the spiritual body is imperishable, meaning it's not subject to change or decomposition. He says the spiritual body is glorious, there's no death. And he says the spiritual body is powerful. And sometimes we wonder, powerful, what kind of power is that? Well, didn't Jesus say that we would be like the angels? If you want to know the type of power that the spiritual body has, perhaps you can examine the type of power that angels have. They have the power over armies and nature and wisdom and space and time. And so we'll have that kind of power, at least that kind of power. And so Paul says that like a seed is transformed into the flower. He says, look at the seed, look at it, an apple seed. It's a little brown thing and it's shiny and it has a little pointy end, that seed. But when you put it into the ground and it decays and it begins to grow, what comes from it? A tree, an apple tree that, has, that have branches and bark and, and, and leaves and, and fruit. Well, does the tree look anything like the seed? Well, of course not. In no way, shape, or form does the seed look anything like the tree. And yet, he says, we have trouble believing that the natural body can become a spiritual body. But he says it's exactly the same process. Paul says that like the seed is transformed into the flower, the natural body will be transformed into the spiritual body at resurrection. And then in verses 45 to 49, he explains why this is so. Pick it up at verse 45. He says, So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. And just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So why, why do our natural bodies die and our spiritual bodies live? Why is that? Well, one reason is that our natural bodies are like this because we share in Adam's nature. And that's as a human being. And then he says, we will be changed into spiritual bodies because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. We have two relationships. We have one with Adam and because of that relationship we have a natural body and that natural body uh, is subject to decay and death. But he says, we also have another relationship and that relationship is with Jesus Christ and because of that relationship we will inherit a spiritual body which is not subject to any decay, any lack of power. So just as our natural bodies resembled Adam because we are born of the flesh, our spiritual bodies will resemble Christ because we are born again in the water and the spirit. The great reward is that we will possess the glorious body similar to Christ's when he ascended into heaven after his resurrection. Well, the next uh, question he deals with is, how and when will all this change place? And this takes up the last few verses of this uh, chapter. So read with me, beginning in verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, 
For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. So what's he tell us about how this is going to take place and when is this going to take place? Well, first of all, he says we cannot resurrect ourselves. Only those who share in Christ's death and resurrection through repentance and baptism will share in his resurrection when he returns. We have to share Christ's nature if we want to experience his resurrection. You know, as I say, a tomato seed cannot grow an apple tree. Only an apple seed grows an apple tree. And my point is, a non-believer seed cannot bloom into a glorious eternal body. Secondly, he says, the final transformation will occur at the last trumpet when we will be changed into our glorious bodies in an instant. Those Christians who are dead will resurrect with glorious bodies. Those Christians alive at his coming will be transformed into glorious bodies in the twinkling of an eye. And all resurrected believers will come together to be with Christ forever. Same thing that he says in the epistles to the Thessalonians. And all this is done to fulfill God's promise that one day death that made its entry into the world through Adam's sin would finally be eliminated through Jesus Christ. The thing that I look forward to the most in heaven, really the most, and, and, and it's the thing that I look forward to the most because it's the thing I relate to now. There's no sin in heaven. I don't know what the angels look like and certainly I don't know what it's like to be in the presence of God and I don't know like what the glorious body is going to be, but I sure know something about sin. That I experience every single day. I know about sin. I am intimately acquainted with sin of every kind. And so when they say, no sin in heaven, oh, I can relate to that. And I'll tell you, even if there wasn't that, the rest of that stuff, I would want to go there just for the part that says, no sin in heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so the final uh, transformation will occur at the very end. And all of this to fulfill his promise that one day uh, death that made its entry into the world through Adam's sin will finally be eliminated through Jesus Christ. No more death and no more death for several reasons. First of all, no more death because Satan is defeated, no longer tempts men. There will not be any repetition of the garden in the next life. No more death because the price of sin is paid for. No more law in heaven to condemn us. And no more death because glorious bodies know what is good and what is evil and they have chosen good in Christ once and for all. As I said, no more sin exists. And so the last verse, verse 58, I'll repeat, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. This has been a very long passage, why I broke it up into, into two lessons. But essentially, it boils down to three main ideas. First of all, the resurrection of Jesus has happened and has been witnessed by hundreds of people, uh, some of whom have documented what they have seen, and we have their witness here in the New Testament. Do not doubt it. Do not doubt it. Secondly, to doubt this fact leads to terrible consequences, the worst of which is the destruction of our own salvation. If Christ isn't raised, then neither are we. If we don't believe that he was resurrected, we will be rejected by him when he returns and the believers are raised. 
I don't want anyone that I know, I don't want anyone that I share my faith with, I don't want anyone that I share this congregation uh, in to be part of a situation where the Lord will say, didn't I give you enough proof? Didn't I give you enough information? Did I not send to you enough preachers and teachers and brethren and witnesses? Did I not do enough for you that you would doubt? And then finally, our own resurrection will be the final act in the process of salvation that will see the wicked destroyed. The wicked will be destroyed. There will be justice. All of this injustice that we see in our world, all of this unfairness that we see, all of this evil and this violence, God promises there will be justice and we will rejoice that justice will finally have been served. And our own resurrection will be the final act in a process of salvation that will see the believers equipped with glorious bodies fit for eternity. I, I don't want to be in front of the Lord with this body because this body could not stand for a moment in front of the Lord. It would disintegrate. He's fitting me and you with a new body so that we are fit to be in the presence of God forever. That's why we need the new body. And our own resurrection will be the final act in the process of salvation that will see a final restoration of God and man in perfect harmony to last forever. You know, I, I can't get my whole mind around this idea. You know, all preachers struggle with it. You know, what is it going to be like? Sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm praying and they say in modern language, I'm in the zone when I'm praying. I think in the Bible they say he was in the spirit. And sometimes we're in the spirit when we pray. It seems that everything we're thinking is, is just, just locks in. We're, we're in tune with God and his spirit. And it's wonderful. And we go on and on for a minute or three minutes or nine minutes maybe or, or a half hour. But you know what happens. The phone rings. A dog barks. You gotta go to the bathroom. You know, you're like, oh, okay, I'll be right back. And the moment is gone. I'm thinking that what God is saying to us is that one day there will be no interruptions in the relationship that we have with Him. No distractions, no weaknesses on our part. It'll go on and on and on and on forever. And so if these things be so, Paul urges them to persevere in the doing of good, knowing by faith that God will accomplish the wonderful things that he has promised when he returns. It's a promise. Why would we ever doubt God's promise? In our Christian lives each day, we have a choice. To believe that we will be resurrected and live together through faith in Jesus Christ, or to doubt and to scoff at his resurrection and the possibility of our own. Brothers and sisters, I exhort you to believe and to demonstrate that belief every day by living lives that are filled, and I mean filled, with purity and devotion to service and faithfulness and love one for another. Every day we show that we are heaven bound by the way we conduct ourselves here on earth. I'm not waiting to be in heaven to be a good person. I want to be a good person here. Amen. And don't be discouraged if the world does not believe. I'm telling you now, it never believed and it's never going to believe. It's never going to change. Why should, be, why should we be discouraged because we're in the minority? The Lord told us we'd be in the minority. And please know that one day, the victory over such things will be complete. You know, Jesus said, it is finished. Well, one day we're going to say, it's finished. It's finished. My struggle is over. It's done. I've arrived. So let's stand 
And let's sing like people who believe, like those who really do have a victory, like those who fully expect to resurrect and live forever with Jesus Christ and all of those who love him. And while we're singing as people who know that they will be resurrected, if you realize that you need the assurance of resurrection by confessing Christ and being baptized or perhaps being restored to him in faithful service through prayer, then take advantage of this unique opportunity to grasp and take hold of that eternal life that God offers you through the gospel this night as we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.